as of late, uh, kind of developed my research interest and conducted the doctorate and done a lot of work in kind of um, the region of sociology and education, then something that became incredibly poignant to me and apparent to me was how much those surroundings mattered. So the um, Bourdieu, the sociologist, uses the concept of capital. And capital is essentially the tools that you have at your disposal, whether they be social, cultural or economic to operate in certain social environments and when I reflect on the types and the forms of capital that were prized at the two different schools they were subtly but very distinctly different at the same time um, so if we look at social capital uh, my um, first school then my mates family members and their friends as I mentioned might have worked in the trades um, they might have left school um, immediately after completing their GCSEs and gone into work uh, my new school people's families members were doctors they were lawyers they were people with experience of higher education and navigating those types of environments um, um, the relationships with, of young men with the educators were different as well. At my first school, there was this very anti-authoritarian school subculture. And if you put your hand up to answer a question in class, then you run the risk of being teased or, or bullied as a result. Whilst at this new school, all the young people and the young men there could have a high social status, but still invest actively energy in their studies. Um, with regards to the dress, that was different. At my first school, it was a polo shirt, it was a jumper, and you could wear black, black trainers. Um, at the second school, it was a blazer, it was a shirt and tie. Um, you know, it was shiny shoes, and I found myself getting off the bus back home and legging it really, really quickly to my house, so none of my friends from my hometown would see the ridiculous get up that um, constituted school uniform at this new place that I'd moved to. Um, but obviously, with economic capital, the money that you have at your disposal influences all of these things as well. So the amount of um, resource you have to take up particular ho hobbies, the interests that you have in holidays and the places that you visit, all of these things were very, very different um, at these two schools. Um, what they amalgamated to mean was that at my first school, um, there were far, far higher risks associated with investing in an educational trajectory that resulted in studying in higher education um, than there were at, at that second score. In other words, the, the gamble that you were taking as an individual who might not have easy access to those resources that can line you up um, was significantly higher. Um, and when it comes to, to risk, it plays a really, really important role in um, not only decision making surrounding higher education, but decision making with regards to even perhaps um, investing your energy in achieving um, a higher GCSE grade. So there's a theory by um, sociologist Stephen Ball and Diane Ray who've conceptualized this idea of higher education decision making and, and ch uh, choice making related to it. And what they say is that um, at two ends of the spectrum for an individual who might be from a working class background there is a historical socially embedded choice and the embedded choice is one that is the familiar route that's inside family experience uh, on the other end of that um, kind of spectrum there's the contingent choice for a working class young person this might be associated with social mobility and it's one that falls directly outside of any family experience, any experience of the com local community, and is completely alien as a concept. Um, and within their investigations for working class young people, what they said was that if we were talking about um, progression to higher education, if we were talking about um, investing in a trajectory aligned with academic success um, and strong GCSE grades, then there was option one, um, 
which essentially was to go for the safe bet, which is a familiar trajectory, one which uh, members of your immediate social network have experienced navigating, um, where everything is comfortable and familiar. There might be a risk of being kind of perhaps stuck in in precarious employment or financial insecurity as a result, but it is something that yourself, your family, the community around you are used to, and you have all of the tools in your toolbox to be able to facilitate that trajectory. You can expect to get there quite easy, uh, easily. And a lot of the time that will align with um, the expectations of those working class communities, which are based on their kind of um, intergenerational social memories. You know, it's not just people here and now, it's parents, it's grandparents, it's based advice coming based on decisions that were perhaps made 50 years ago when that grandparent was in school themselves. Option two, and this contingent choice, the different one, is to follow a new educational trajectory outside of the family's experience, um, often involving the deferment of paid work, the accrual of student debt, and possibly moving away from close family and friends um, who support you. Um, Whilst at the same time as doing all this, finding ways to access knowledge and social networks, so that cultural and social capital um, to facilitate successful entry into higher education, whether that's in the form of academic grades, knowledge about personal statements, um, an indication of how to navigate the student finance system, none of which is easily accessible to you at that particular time. Now, a lot of the time when we talk about young people, you hear the raising aspirations narrative, don't you? Um, which is heavily contested within research um, and has been, uh, we'll move on to it a little bit later, but um, proven not to be a equitable and impactful way of developing orientations towards higher education. But if we just take aspirations, then that leaves out of all of those things and it doesn't and bring into conversation the risks that young people from working class backgrounds who might have no experience previous of higher education are are taking in putting into practice things which align with that particular route. On top of all that, um, and it's something that I know I haven't spoken about too much yet, but we've also got the role of masculinity in educational engagement and progression, which adds a whole new layer and dimension of complexity to it. Those um, in the research called it normative working class masculinities, how um, the actions that you take in a classroom setting or outside of a classroom setting um, the emotions you display, the the dispositions you voice towards certain futures all have potential social consequences for you. And this isn't new. If we look at um, working class boys in education and the research surrounding it, then it goes back um, pretty much over 50 years now. If there's anyone who ever did kind of sociology A-level, one of the things on the curriculum might well have been Paul Willis's Learning to Labour, which was published in 1977. And um, within Willis's study, then he identified, it was at school in the, the West Midlands in the Black Country, and he identified two distinct groups of students that were um engaging in practices as part of an in-school subculture. The ones that was probably most popular and you'd be most likely to heard of is the, the lads. And the lads in Willis's study basically actively rejected the idea of school in preparation for an industrial job working in a factory that potentially awaited them. In other words, they saw no use or value to education in their future career orientations because they knew they could get those jobs potentially without investing in education as a route um, towards a desired occupational outcome. Uh, the other group in Willis's study were the year olds, and the year olds were um, a group which were basically um, positioned as the antithesis of the the lads um, displaying characteristics which the lads saw as undesirable and effeminate that it might have included investing or having a good relationship with educators in the school. Um, whilst 
Willis's Learning to Labour is held up as kind of the seminal text when it comes to working class boys in education and their uh, trajectories. It's it's not free of criticism. Firstly, um, you can see a whole spectrum there. That was 1977, 78, um, and the world has changed significantly since then. But even if you just look at the two groups Willis explores, then it was the two ends of the spectrum. Um, in Schooling Ordinary Kids by Philip Brown, which was written in the 80s, um, what Philip Brown did was looked at the students that were in the middle that weren't those that were really anti-authoritarian, that weren't those ones um, that, that were the year olds, but rather the practices of working class kids in Wales um, and their attitudes to education, who were the ones that were just getting by. Um, and what he positioned schooling as quite a lot of the time for these students in particular and these young men was school was just something to get through and a necessary evil to get to employment they weren't adopting all of these extreme dispositions that that willis um kind of shone a light on in his research necessarily um but they were um certainly biding their time to, to get out into the, the world of work and employment. Um, later down the line, so we had The Making of Men by McGill in the um, kind of 90s. And all of these texts essentially chart socioeconomic change as well and deindustrialization. Um, the socioeconomic landscape of the 70s and 80s, you know, we were talking about a Thatcherite government um, and whole scale, kind of wholesale economic shifts towards this um, new service driven economy. And what it means now in contemporary research is that um, what has been highlighted, particularly in deindustrialized communities, is a bit of a dink disjuncture um, between the collective memory and those working class kind of dispositions, if you like, that young men um, held that have been prized in working class communities and the economic environment and the opportunities for employment that they now find themselves in and there's a, a disjuncture and a misalignment with that. Um, if you're interested in finding about more about that, I'd really recommend Mike Ward's, Ward's book um, from Labouring to Learning. I think that was in 2017, he published that um, and that's in the Welsh Valleys. Um, and it's a big piece of kind of ethnographic research that Ward did where he examines the identity formation of these young men as they transition through school and into further education college. Um, the final one, Working Class Boys and Educational Success by Nicola Ingram um, examines how men or young boys from Northern Ireland negotiated their identity if they were perhaps from a working class background but attended um, a more middle class setting of a grammar school and the implications of the misalignment between perhaps the identity that they brought into the space and that school culture had for their investment in education and their future educational orientations as well. Um, so that's basically just a whistle stop tour of everything to do with um, working class boys in education over the last 50 years or so. So I could talk at length on any of those books, but I thought it was really important just to highlight that within sociological, social, educational research, this is an issue um, that isn't one that's new. It's It's been around for an awful long time, but I think what we need to do collectively now, and hopefully what we've started to do um, within the research that we've conducted and the projects we've been delivering, is discover how this plays out in the experiences of working class boys today. Um, I'd also like to flag, I know I've used the term working class a lot, and it can be quite an ambiguous term, and it's quite contested in terms of what it means. When I'm talking about working class, what I mean is young men who are at the sharp end of experiences of socioeconomic inequality. Um, so those that might be eligible um, for free school meals, for example. And if we look at those boys in particular, um, then what does the data tell us here and now? Well, it tells us that they are significantly less likely to achieve a nine to five in GCSE maths and English um, than boys who are not eligible for free school meals. Uh, the difference is around nationally, around 25% that gap in between the two groups. And they're also less likely um, to achieve 
those than girls who might be eligible for free school meals as well. Now, this varies depending on where you look. If we were to look at the Isle of Wight specifically, um, then that figure might, it goes as low as 9% of boys um, who achieve nine to five in GCSE. Um, who are eligible for free school meals, whilst if we look at London or Birmingham, the rate can be slightly higher. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this translates into higher education progression and participation as well. So um, on the statistics from 2021-22, if we take a look, um, if you're a white British boy and you're eligible for free school meals, then um, the proportion of that group that enter into higher education is 13%, uh, white and black Caribbean boys, 18%, um, and white Irish or black Caribbean, 20%. So significantly low numbers of young men from those groups engaging in higher education um, when compared to those who aren't eligible for free school meals. And as the academic research showed us, this is an issue that goes back years and years and years. You know, Willis's learning to labour was in 1977. There was a reason that he was motivated to explore that particular bit of research and it was to do um, with those attitudes or dispositions of working class boys towards education. And what we found all the way through is that there's been a lot of policy reports, there have been a lot of government documents, um, and there has been a lot of interest sporadically throughout that time with policy makers who essentially have framed and reframed the issue. However, what we found also is that there has been very, very little action to actually address that issue. So in 2019, an access and participation plan review by the Office for Students of University Access and Participation Plans, their strategic documents um, that set out how they're going to conduct activity with groups who are underrepresented um, in higher education, suggested that of 838 targets that were set relating to access, success and progression by universities, only 11 gave specific mention to, to white working class males or you know boys who are eligible for free school meals as a group that they were targeting. Um, in other words, against this backdrop of consistent um, narratives in policy um, where it's been framed and platformed and replatformed as one of importance, when it comes to universities conducting activity, less than 2% of access and participation plans gave any reference to the group with, whatsoever within their targets. Um, and what that means is that we need to take action. You know, we need to start to drive forward activity that is targeted, um, and that we can start to evaluate to judge how impactful it is and learn from that and develop it. However, um, we also come from a place where a lot of the activity that has been undertaken is based on assumption or preconceptions which are contested. One of the most popular accusations, if you like, to level at young men um, from working class backgrounds is that they lack aspiration. The idea that... Um, they aren't ambitious enough, they don't hope high, high enough, and because they're not having high enough hopes, then they won't achieve their goals. Um, I've just shown a few slides back there talking about risk, talking about that complex amalgamation of things that, that, that go on, and um, the amount of work that would need to be undertaken by an individual from a working class background to frame higher education participation as an expectation. Um, and aspirations are woolly within their very nature. You know, if you look at the def dictionary definition, they're a hope or ambition of achieving something, um, whilst an expectation is something that will probably be the case. And if we're looking at evidence with regards to the efficacy of aspiration interventions, you know, if you're looking at raising aspiration as a primary motivation, then the Education um, Endowment Foundation have, have run a project where they've gathered the research and they've got little or no evidence to suggest that it's effective. Um, whilst there is a growing body of evidence to suggest that framing interventions around expectation and providing those resources is something that can be really helpful. There's also a lot of stereotypes about what working class boys are interested in. I bet, you know, it take you three or four minutes to think of boxing, football, um, 
FIFA computer games. And yeah, of course, whilst they are some young men and a lot of young men that are interested in those things, just because a young man is from a background where perhaps they might not have access to um, resources and opportunities that their more middle class counterparts do, does not mean they're this homogenous blob. It doesn't mean that there is this one group that we can all bundle together that share these same dispositions. Um, and I think it's really difficult if we're having conversations constantly based on stereotypical assumptions um, that we are overlaying onto this group. And it's reinforced by media narratives. You can see the images up there. You know, we've got uh, the, Ofsted, the old Ofsted chief saying that poor white communities lacked aspiration and drive. Um, there's an article from Wales Online where it's saying that boys view being asked to read as a punishment, say one in three teachers. Um, and what does that do if you're an educator? If you're an educator that holds an assumption that all of the young men in your classroom are going to view reading as a punishment. How does that change your pedagogy? How does that start to change the way that you engage with these young men? So you can see it there straight away. Um, there's been some research by uh, Deborah Myhill back in 2004 with teacher surveys that showed even if we don't like it, that actually um, there are things going on with regards to expectations of young men in education by teaching practitioners that do have an impact upon their attainment. Um, and the last one, and one that I think is, is really harmful, is tropes that we see about white working class boys that are perhaps linked to culture wars narratives. Um, these tropes that are positionalise um, groups against each other and seem obsessively focused on the fact that these young working class men are white rather than these young working class men are working class and they've experienced multiple generations of inequality economically um, that it bleeds out into the history of their local geographies, their communities and the, the social fabric that their educational dispositions are built on. If we are to engage in meaningful practice with the group, then centralising the importance of that collective memory of that place um, of that, that location, that geography is, is hugely important. And it doesn't matter whether that's in London, Newcastle, Isle of Wight, Bournemouth, it's all going to look very, very different. But to understand how we can effectively work with groups of young men, then we need to understand the things that are important to them, the things that they care about, their community. Um, so if it's not about all that, then what's it about when it comes to these disparities in educational attainment? Well, research has demonstrated that it's an amalgamation of different elements. It's not just one by itself. It's related to mental health. It's related to relationships, peer pressure, those teacher expectations that I spoke about, sex and sexism, socioeconomic inequality, and those are some notions surrounding engagement and engagement strategies as well and those things that aren't borne out necessarily in evidence that we all might hold within our head um, and the really sad thing about this is if you looked at the contributory elements to the disproportionately high rate of suicide with men or addiction or homelessness or entry into the criminal justice system, then that list of contributory elements isn't going to look too different at all. Um, it's also quite easy, I think, and quite understandable if you are um, somebody who is incredibly passionate about gender equality to view this as quite oppositional as well, um, to believe and quite rightly, you know, cases that the byproduct of targeting activity towards young men from working class backgrounds is that young girls from working class backgrounds miss out on the activity because those young men are targeted. However, I'd just like to show share this quote by JJ Bowler, um, who wrote a brilliant book called Mask Off, Masculinity Redefined. Um, and when it comes to the patriarchal structures and systems in society, then I think he describes it quite well. Because society is generally patriarchal in that it favours men that occupy privileged positions, it makes it seem as though men do not have issues they also suffer from. It's a kind of double-edged sword, a poisonous panacea. That is to say, the same system that puts men in an advantage in society is essentially the same system that lives limits them, inhibits their growth, and eventually leads to their breakdown. Um, within this patriarchal societal structure and system that we were, live in, the one that means that um, 
men occupy privileged positions in the workplace, get paid more, um, and a whole host of other ills happen related to those gender-based inequalities. Those same things put that put the men at the advantage within that those same structures are also the ones that are harming them. You know, it's the double-edged sword. It's the same system that's causing that those disparities in GCSE outcomes. It's those same things that are causing those higher suicide rates, those rates of homelessness and addiction. Um, so for me, working with young men to address these things, uh, the patriarchal structures in a society and the byproducts of that society for them is contributing towards a society that tackles those structural challenges that we face. Um, I think it's really important uh, to, to recognise that. Um, so if we go back to that idea of risk and we think about it and the embedded and the contingent choice, then you can start to see how when you add masculinity into the mix alongside um, the socioeconomic inequality, then it really has that compounding effect. And that compounding effect is borne out in evidence of the data that we saw around GCSE attainment, around progression to higher education. Um, but the thing is, it's not a binary, right? It's not an either or, it's not an embedded choice or a contingent choice, what you will probably find and what in my doctoral thesis I imagined it as is a tightrope. And depending on the resources that a young person might have available to mitigate some of those risks that we spoke about, um, then, you know, they will travel a varying degree or varying distance across that tightrope towards that contingent choice. What you find with young men is that the risk is increased by those things that might be seen as deviating from those normative masculine expectations, whether that be investing educationally, displaying emotion, or not engaging in activities that could perhaps be risky and harmful. So where does all that leave us? Well, it leaves us with a challenge that's really nuanced and complex one that's intrinsically linked to intergenerational experiences of systemic inequality. Um, it leaves us in the knowledge that activity based on those stereotypes, typical assumptions are at best unhelpful. Um, we know that because otherwise we would see evidence of the dial moving in terms of GCSE outcomes and progression to higher education, but it's simply not happening. So we have a great deal of unlearning to do surrounding what constitutes meaningful engagement with young men in education. And to do that, we need to start to listen and learn from the real experts in this. Um, and they're not us, you know. I, I might have experienced challenges in my educational experiences, but they were done at a time when the internet wasn't a thing and I didn't have a mobile phone. The only people who are going to be able to effectively articulate to us what life is like for them in Bournemouth or London or Manchester in 2024 is the young men themselves. So at Arch University Bournemouth, um, a couple of years ago, we launched Being a Boy, which was a project designed to mobilise our creative tools as a university to start to explore those things. It was a listening activity to learn about the experiences of working class young men um, and an opportunity for them to engage in creative mediums that they might not otherwise have had the opportunity to. Um, alongside the project itself, we um ran research as well qualitative research and we've just had our first paper published in the journal of boyhood studies which examines how um the intervention facilitated the opportunity for young men engaged to imagine alternative possible selves or futures that perhaps otherwise wouldn't have been available to them um the data that we used to do this was creative artifacts produced through the workshops and analysis of that, so creative writing, photography, dance. And we also ran semi-structured interviews with the young men who were studying at one particular alternative provision. Uh, the AP um, was um, it had three GCSEs available in maths, English and science, but lots of vocational opportunities. And it was for young people that had been excluded from mainstream education. And what we wanted to do was have a look at the project and whether it um, influenced those participants' conceptualization of the possible for their future in education and work. Um, so we scaffolded the workshops with an awful lot more than 
just the three workshops because um, we recognise the primacy of relationships, the importance of building trust and rapport. So over the course of about a year with the young people that were the core participants and those that we interviewed, then we had about 11 encounters with them across the space of 12 months. Some of them were informal, things like lunches and a chat. Um, others were a VR design workshop or a workshop in documentary filmmaking um, because alongside the project, we made a documentary and the young people were very engaged um, in not just kind of featuring the documentary but also producing it as well. I've just got a couple of the outputs here from the creative work writing workshop that I'd like to to share with you. Um, the first one is My Story Starts With Me and it's a poem. I originate from Bournemouth Hospitality. I grew up with a family that's not filled with glee. I remember when it was my brother, my mother and me. My roots are dug so deep into theirs. The embers of my story begin with my family. The beginning of the route begins with the beginning of the choice. The journey started with me. I emerged from my mother and father creating me. I was born and raised in a broken family. I rose up and tried to fix my broken family. Engaging in creative writing and that particular workshop provided a key for these young men to articulate things that they perhaps never would have um, had it been a, a verbal conversation with us. And what we did with some of the, the poetry in the follow-up interviews was use that um, in kind of what researchers term as a third object and a way to unlock um, deeper discussion. They also, um, created visual images through photography as well, um, concerning representations of masculinity, how they feel they're seen by society, um, how their peers represent masculinity and how they'd like to represent their own masculinity in the future. Again, these were brought back to them um, and were topics for discussion with some of the young men from alternative provision. Um, I'm not going to read out all of them to you. I'm aware that we're getting quite close on time. Um, but what we saw, especially within the creative writing workshops, is it provided a safety to explore masculinity within its boundaries. Um, they spoke about the ability of the facilitator to flatten the power dynamic, but also that it was a safe space for things to be articulated and they weren't worried about the risk of the Mickey being taken out of them. Um, however, outside the boundaries of the project, then that was very much a concern. I asked one of the um, participants if they would feel comfortable do, kind of engaging in those reflections in the classroom in their alternative provision. Um, and they said, no, the bullying and torment torment would definitely go up for something stupid like writing how I feel on a page. Um, there was also harm outside of those boundaries as well. I was chatting to one lad um, who struggled with his anger about how he controlled it um, and essentially he felt like he got better at it because the way that he engaged in controlling his anger was by himself in his room but it was hitting wooden desks and drawers. Um, they were very very proud of the artifacts that they produced um, Often they were placed prominently within the room when we had our celebration event. They were so excited to invite family members um, down to see what they did because often they didn't have the opportunity within the school setting um, to celebrate those successes. But one of the participants mentioned how they'd got seven or eight tickets to the celebration event and there was a whole um, kind of tribe of them coming down, which was lovely. Um, the project overall... Um, provided access to new forms of social and cultural capital associated with creative higher education for the participants. Um, it was an engage, project engagement that was markedly different to their experience as young men, um, kind of inside and outside of the AP, and it afforded a safe space for them to reflect on their own negotiations of masculinity. Uh, they spoke with pride about the production of their creative artifacts and viewed it as a, an accomplishment. And that's all great. However, there were very clear limitations as well. In many ways, being a boy followed the format of a traditional university outreach activity, which meant there was limited time to build trust and rapport. It wasn't a long-term and sustained and progressive program. And it took place in different 
environments which weren't reflective of their usual educational experience. Because of this, it had little power to mitigate wider risks and challenges present within their day-to-day -edu -day educational experience. And it was hard to quantify impact against measures which school performance and student attainment are assessed. You know, we couldn't say in the project, yes, uh, because students engaged with these, they were more likely to, to attend school or the rates of internal exclusion or sanctioning went down or there was a movement um, in, in PA. So actually, whilst we might have unlocked new possible selves, were we developing those expectations and, and shifting the dial on the probable selves, those things that were going to likely to happen? In my view, probably not. Um, so what we've been doing ever since is activity to address those limitations um, and start to work together using a shared set of valuables and values and principles to build evidence. Uh, in 2012, the Northern Irish government funded some research um, into inequality and um, adolescent male school life experiences in Northern Ireland. That research has been running ever since at the University of Ulster, the Taking Boys Seriously team, and through their large scale action research, including about 35 different um, school and community organisations and over 400 participants, they've developed the Taking Boys Seriously principles, which are a relational approach to educational engagement. Uh, they're based in evidence and they give us a template to work from. So locally, what we've started to do, um, for, Firstly, in partnership with Ferndown Upper School and Deneen Kenchington, the deputy head over there, um, is work with them to transfer the, the learning and the conceptual approach we take to the work at the university into that school context and that classroom as well. Um, so Ferndown Upper School have become a Taking Boys Seriously school and have taken a whole school approach to implementing some of those Taking Boys Seriously principles. Um, we've been with them on the journey for the last couple of years and last September um, well, August, sorry, at GCSE results time was the first time that they'd closed their gap um, completely between boys and girls when it came to their GCSE outcomes and attainment. Um, so a, a very good example, potentially, uh, uh, of what's possible. However, it is just one example. And what we need to do is replicate that in other places to build this bank of evidence and learn to have robust evaluation um, happening in a lot of places to really drive forward our understanding as a sector. Uh, in November, we had our first meeting of Dorset Boys Impact Hub, which brought together multiple stakeholders from across the um, Dorset region, including the two universities um, and also a lot of senior leaders from schools um, around the, the, the county who are interested in developing evidence-based activity uh, um, based on those Taking Boys Seriously principles. As a hub, we want to convene key stakeholders around the issue, drive effective practice. We want to develop our understanding of the challenges facing our young men in their particular geographic, social and historical context. Remember, I spoke a little bit before about the importance of those contextual factors. We want to research the issues, and learn and disseminate effective practice and through something much bigger, Boys Impact, a national network, we want to contribute to developing the evidence base of effective practice in supporting the educational outcomes of boys who are eligible for free school meals. Essentially, we want to coordinate a, a mechanism, an overarching structure where we can work together to develop activity, we can pilot new approaches and learn from each other, not focusing on the what of activity, the the nature of the workshop that's taking place in terms of whether it's an art workshop or whether it's a nursing workshop or a STEM workshop, but rather the how, that relational engagement with the young men that uh, empowers them um, to feel that their voices are valued and valuable within those educational spaces. Nationally, we've now held two conferences. Uh, fantastic to see a lot of colleagues from Greater Manchester Higher and Manchester University on the call. Our last one was at the um, Manchester Metropolitan University back in September, convened around 120 stakeholders from education around the issue and started to discuss how we could set up these structures for a national um, hub. We submitted evidence to an inquiry that was launched by the all-party parliamentary group on issues affecting men and boys. Um, they had an education report and um, 
within the recommendations from that report, then Boys Impact and this gro growing this body of research, um, the recommendation that was fully supported, which was great to see. And we've started to have conversations with large multi academy trusts such as United Learning, um, who have about 100 schools across the country, and we're working with their director of the Premium Premium Strategy um, to start a larger scale pilots and explore activities across regions. Um, last month, just before Christmas, I was also up in Manchester uh, to support the launch in Manchester Boys Impact Hub up there. And we've got a meeting with stakeholders online on the 24th of, of this month. Um, so hopefully, yeah, Greater Manchester Higher um, and the Stamford Park Educational Trust will be um, really developing activity up that way too. Um, so it's exciting times. It's all stuff that's needed though. From my personal perspective, it's criminal that after all of that research that's been framing and reframing the issue of disparities in educational attainment for working class boys, um, we're in a position where there still isn't any significant, well-structured, robust, tested activity to get, point us in the right direction with regard to um, what can be most impactful and what needs to happen to really shift that dial in the ecosystems and the cultures of our schools, colleges and universities. Um, so this slide I'm going to end on, it's the Boys Impact Mission Statement um, for the National Organisation. We're a collective dedicated to addressing the gap in GCSE outcomes for young men who receive free school meals. Boys Impact are evidence-based. We celebrate the richness and diversity of young men's experiences and support them on their journey towards a happy, healthy future. On the 21st of February, we're running some CPD with an organisation called Progressive Masculinity, who have a fantastic um, reputation nationally for impactful work in the classroom to support um, teachers engage with young men on issues related to masculinity and educational inequality. Uh, we're currently half full with Dorset Boys Impact Hub members in that training at the moment. Um, but if you are local to the Dorset area and would like to attend in person, then I will make sure I circulate the details with Talia following today and I now realise that I've spoken for 52 minutes-ish probably um, non-stop and you could all do with a break from my voice so I'll just leave you on this final slide um, which also just lists some really really impactful and influential books that I've read and podcasts that I've listened to, listened to that if you're interested in finding out more about this might be a really really nice starting point. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alex. That was brilliant. Um, one of the questions that I was going to ask, actually, is do you have any sort of role models that you would suggest? And I can see you've got like Rylan on there as well. Um, are there just any others that, you know, you can subtly like drop into different classes or that sort of thing that you think are good role models in in that sector? Because obviously they, they've got hundreds in the world of sport and music and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I would say that rather than picking a specific one, it's important to show a diversity of masculinity and mm -hmm. different individuals that are um, really inspirational, potentially for a number of different reasons, um, rather than just focusing in on, on, on one or two specifically. One of the things that... Um, I think we've got a lot of work to do around is, you know, we are very, very good at encouraging girls into STEM related subjects. Um, there's next to no strategic activity that's doing the other way around and encouraging men into yeah. to care based professions. Um, I know from being a young carer myself, having you know issues, um, uh, a father, you know, that struggled with mental health issues with addiction that actually my superpowers, if you like, were empathy, were care, were being able to articulate thoughts and feelings and being quite sensitive to the feelings of others. You know, I spent a whole period of time at school where I really actively rejected that because showing those things painted a bit of a target on my back. But um, now that I'm older, those things are my superpower. You know, those are the things that I can um, consistently come back to that really shape my opportunity to have a happy, full and rich life. And I think it's for that reason, not getting more men into the workforce, because that in itself is a good thing, but actually providing these legitimate structured opportunity for care and empathy amongst young men to be valued and recognised. Yeah, 